is the W123 series of $100,000 car. <laughs> I'm sure that there are a lot of you that are like, oh, Pierre's lost his mind, what's going on? But uh, we're, we're getting into this sort of topic now where some really nice low mileage 123 series cars are coming to market. And it's a lot of, it's a very difficult concept for somebody to wrap their head around a $100,000, let's say 300D turbo when they just bought one for $1,200 on Craigslist that ran and drove and needed glow plugs. But you know, the, the way that I look at the 123 market is that there are really two markets. There are people that value the car for their intrinsic value, and then there are people that value the car because it could potentially have high intrinsic value, but actually to them it's, it's almost like a, a, I don't want to say a fetish, but it's an itch that they want to scratch because now the cars are so different, they're so differentiated from modern cars that there's this curiosity that a lot of people have and a lot of these guys don't end up becoming long-term owners but they're willing to pay fifty, sixty thousand dollars to scratch an itch. So let's ask ourselves a couple questions here. First of all, what's the difference between a fifty thousand dollar car, a one hundred thousand dollar car, a five hundred thousand dollar car, and a one million dollar car? A fifty thousand dollar car isn't really an affordable car. It's not affordable like a two or three thousand dollar car is. But the gap between, let's say, a $7,000 car and a $50,000 car is something like $43,000. It's not that much. Now, if you look at a $100,000 car, the gap between a $50,000 car, because it's exponentially harder to earn $100,000 than it is $50,000. I've learned that running my own business. You know, there have been very few times when I've had, when I've had a year where I've like, looked at my finances and said, wow, I almost made $100,000 this year. More, more often than not, it's closer to 50 k And I look at how much grinding I have to do for 50 k The years that were 100 k years for me, I was absolutely exhausted on December 31st. I didn't want to wake up the next day and go, you know, go do it again. But my, my point is that um, the gap between a $50,000 and a $100,000 car is actually perceivedly less severe, less painful looking than the gap between a $5,000 car and a $50,000 car. That's because it's really hard to go from $5,000 to $50,000. But if you could go from $50,000, if you can accumulate $50,000, there's no reason why you can't accumulate $100,000. You know, it's a very strange mindset, but I've heard finance people say this before. If you can afford something that costs fifty thousand dollars, you could probably afford something that costs a hundred. If you can afford something that costs a hundred thousand dollars, at some point in your life, you'll be able to afford something that costs five hundred thousand dollars. So, there are one twenty three selling for fifty thousand dollars in the current day, and that means that. As that demographic acquires more wealth and there are fewer really low mileage, excellent cars to choose from, the $100,000 123 is probably going to be a reality within the next five to 10 years, especially when you take into account things like uncertainty in the stock market, real estate being essentially a pump and dump scheme by developers and banks and BlackRock and all sorts of weird companies that none of us have no connection to. Um, I also see the potential for a lot of other weird investments, but you know, a one hundred thousand dollar one twenty three is not going to be anyone's daily driver, unless there's sort some sort of you know weird millionaire that just doesn't value stuff. What I am thinking is that by two thousand twenty five. Somewhere in the 2025 to 2027 window, we're going to see our first clutch 100K 123 sales, and they're probably going to be private sales. Maybe one or two will be an auction sale. But certainly, like four out of the five will be for station wagons, and maybe one will be for a coupe. We may see this before, we may see it next year, we may see it by the end of this year. It depends on how our economy holds up. But I. I absolutely see pristine versions of the 123 series as some sort of weird investment that people understand is 
probably never going to be repeated. And that's, you know, we're never going to have another Rembrandt. We're never going to have another Picasso. We're probably never going to have another authentic gold Rolex Daytona unless, I don't know. I mean, obviously, obviously watches are a whole different thing, but I'm just saying the original version of something is always the most valuable. We're certainly never going to have another 123 series again. You know, and what I perceive happening with values of most Mercedes with diesel engines from this era is that really great examples are going to keep appreciating because they have some sort of weird niche apocalyptic doomsday value. But in reality, I don't think anybody's ever going to use them for that. I think that their real value is what the idea they represent rather than what they actually are. That's why if you want a 123 you can drive, there are plenty of high mileage $300,000 cars that are infinitely repairable available. That's why it also doesn't make sense if you want a car you can daily drive to go buy a $50,000 example. So I'm not saying that this is like the best, most logical decision, but hopefully higher 123 sales will lead to better preservation of the cars that do exist that aren't 50,000 mile perfect cars. Just saying. Anyway, I know some of you are going to be a little irked by this video. Just remember that most of the people who will pay 100 k for a 123 won't touch a 200,000 mile car that's a decent, solid three or four owner car. They just don't touch it. They're, they, think that they think they're too good for it, you know? It's, it's like the typical, like, bring a trailer snowflake mentality where anytime somebody sees, like, that the car needs something or has issues or whatever, they just don't touch it. The car ends up no-selling or being sold way below reserve or something like that. So the cars are always going to be out there. It's just we have to take care of the cars we have because we shouldn't be turning the 50,000-mile cars into, like, 300,000 mile drivers. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be forcing people to, or expecting people to buy our 300,000 mile 82 300D sedan for $50,000 at some point in the future. It's not going to happen. People aren't stupid, but uh, that's why I say there are two distinct markets. So enjoy and appreciate the car that you have because people really are starting to value these things, and that's a good thing. You know, hopefully Mercedes will take notice. So. Anyway, if you found this video informative, please think about subscribing to our channel. Please like it and share it if you know somebody that's interested in buying a classic Mercedes. And if you're thinking about buying a classic Mercedes, remember you don't have to have a super low mileage car to have a good car. You also don't need to have a car that's advertised and bring a trailer. Bring a trailer is the antithesis of the... It takes all the fun out of buying a classic car. You just sit there and click on a, a mouse, and that's no fun. You're supposed to be digging through a barn or looking at a storage unit or driving in the middle of nowhere, and you see something on the side of the road. And that's how, really, the process is supposed to go. That's how you create the lifelong bond with the car. Other, otherwise, it just begins... It, it's just sort of like shopping on Amazon. I can't think of how many Amazon items I've discarded. So try to use a little bit of emotion and logic when buying your next car, but use more logic than emotion. I'll see you in the next video.